Hopefully that's recording. Welcome to CS 2050. Uh, the topic of today is predicates and quantifiers. Two quick things. One, I think the schedule is slightly off because I realized that I was missing something today. So I'm thinking of doing like two 40 minute videos and then maybe a 40 minute uh, little worksheet thing we'll do uh, uh, later today. Second is that I have this stain on my shirt. Five people asked me about this on the way here, so I just want to point it out because everyone could be staring at it the whole time. I don't know how it got there. It wasn't there 20 minutes ago. So I have to get that out the way. My boss even said, what happened to your shirt? So um, somewhat embarrassing. Um, so the first maybe, I don't know how long it'll take, maybe 40 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, whatever. Is there going to be predicates and quantifiers? Just definitions. Then the next half we'll do inference, and then we'll do our little worksheet. That's hopefully the goal uh, for today. Um, predicates and quantifiers. So uh, we mentioned last time about uh, propositions. Uh, and propositions can be assigned truth values. Right? You look at a declarative sentence and you say, uh, that is true or that is not true. Um, for example, 10 is greater than 7 is an example of a proposition because you can look at it and you can say, that's true. Another thing would be you could look at a proposition and say, well, that's false. You know? Those are propositions, are the declarative parts of language which can be assigned a truth value. Now, there are some, thing, there are some statements which appear to not be assignable a truth value. Um, for example, n is greater than 7. That is not a proposition, but actually we can still talk about truth relative to a certain statement. Because if you were to fix n, you could assert a truth value. Do you agree? Just leaving n as it is, you cannot assign it a truth value because the truth depends on n. But if you fix n, you can say it's true or false. That's all really what a function is. So what we can do is define what's called a predicate or a propositional function. A predicate or a propositional function is one which uh, is, takes on some number of variables and uh, is defined to be uh, outputted to true or false, right? So, but the truth of the predicate can only be determined after you've uh, filled in all the variables. Once the, pro once the predicate has no more free variables, then it can be assigned a truth value, right? Um, we usually use a capital letter as well. Sometimes we use a Greek capital letter, like capital phi, something like this. Uh, for a predicate, in contrast to a lowercase letter, which is a proposition or propositional variable, right? P, Q, R, propositional variables, uh, propositions. Capital P, capital P is going to be a predicate, right? Now, for example, just for this example, what is P of 10? True. What is P of 7? False. 7 is not strictly greater than 7. What about P of 6? Yeah. So depending upon what the uh, variable is assigned to, it can be, a predicate can be true or false. It's a function. Um, now there's also, importantly, is something called the uh, universe of discourse. Or simply the domain. We got to use the word universe of discourse because it sounds cooler. Universe or, do or domain of discourse. This will become more formal as we, uh, as next week we go into set theory. But the, the propositional variable may take on a value from some known collection of possible values. For example, n here, the universe of discourse of n is numbers. Now, what kind of numbers, real numbers, uh, natural numbers, we'll have to talk more about set theory. But it's, it's understood that n comes from some specified universe of discourse. Right? Um, these all mean the same thing in, in, in the literature. Right? Uh, consider the following uh, predicate, p of x comma y. And of course, 
functions may take on multiple arguments. Same thing here. We may have uh, several uh, predicates. Um, to be uh, if x is greater than 0, then uh, x plus y is equal to 10. Right? This is a valid predicate. Would you agree? Can it be assigned a truth value? No, but not until you evaluate all its arguments. So just as an exercise, what is p of uh, negative 1, comma 100? False. It no. is true. Why is this true? Why is this not false? Because um, uh, minus 1 uh, bigger than 0 is false. Yeah, so the, the recall p implies q. If p is false, the, whole st the p implies q is true, right? So if x is greater than 0, then x plus y is equal to 10. The only time that a conditional is false is if p is q and true is false, right? Here p is x greater than 0, and q is x plus y is equal to 10. So if p is false, if x is not greater than 0, then the whole predicate then the whole, excuse me, now it's assigned a truth value because both uh, of its free variables have been evaluated. Well, if the premise is false, then the whole conditional is true, right? What about something a little more sane? What about a 4, 6? True or false? True. True. Why? Is 4 greater than 0? Yes. Is 4 plus 6 equal to 10? Yes. So it's true, implies true, which is true. Uh, what about... P of uh, 4, 5. False. It's false. 4 is greater than 0, but then 4 plus 5 is 9, which is not 10. Right? We see if I gave you a predicate, and as you evaluate it, find values that it's true for, you perhaps can do this. You've been dealing with functions your whole life. Um, not the hardest generalization, right? Any questions just on like the definition of a predicate so far? All right, uh, pop quiz. What is p of uh, negative one comma y? True. Yeah. So first off, uh, y is unevaluated. Is this a predicate or a proposition? This is an open-ended question, and there's not exactly a right answer, but I'll explain why there is one. Is this a predicate or a proposition? It's a predicate. Yet, we can assign it a truth value. Propositions are statements we can assign a truth value. Predicates are statements that we can assign a truth value only after. Predicates become propositions only after we've evaluated all three variables. Yet, we know, no matter what y is, as long as there's negative 1 here, the statement is true. Why? Because the premise... Uh, the, the assumption is false. And we know that anytime the assumption is false, the whole thing is, anytime the premise is false, the whole thing is true, right? Recall that P implies Q is equivalent to not P or Q. So if P is, if P is false, then you have an or with true, so it's true, right? But even then, even though this is true for all values, we would still define this to be a predicate and not a proposition, even if we may assign it a truth value. The reason for this is just really a type thing, right? Um, a predicate is, a, a proposition is not one that may be defined a truth value, but a predicate becomes a proposition when it has no free variables. That's really the definition. It's the same reason that f of x, any constant function, consider f of x equals zero, right? This is a function, right? This is not a number. This is a function. It doesn't have any interesting behavior other than a number, but it is still considered a function, right? This is not a number, this is a function. Same reason this is a predicate and not a proposition. Just a small type issue, right? All right, any question? anyone, everyone got that? Any questions on predicates? Just the basic definition of what a predicate is? Sort of simple, right? Um, so P is a predicate, right? Yes, um, capital P. Lowercase p may be a proposition or propositional variable. It's an atomic element the large P is usually denoting a predicate. Or sometimes we call it a propositional function. Yes? Uh, the 
think it's going to be propositional functions? Yeah, that's the, those are the definitions for the same things. Yeah, predicate, propositional function, predicate is cooler, right? In math, we have to use as much wizard-like language as possible. You know, that's why, that's the, literally the only reason I prefer use, calling it a universe of discourse over a domain. Domains make so much more sense in the context of a function, because a, a function is a domain in range. You may be used to that. But universe of discourse sounds cooler, right? So, um, right. Uh, so some, we're, we're again, we're trying to formalize declarative English. Uh, sentences that can be assigned truth value. And if you had a keen eye, you, there were some kinds of sentences we kind of ignored when we were discussing the propositional uh, logic, when we took certain English sentences and assigned them truth value, is the words of some, many, uh, there, there is, and these assert truth value um, over like uh, the existence of something. This is an exist. So what we'll talk about now is something called existential quantification. Quantification. Vication. Okay, yeah. So a quantification is basically uh, where you assign one of the variables. Uh, an, an existential quantification is where you say, one of the free variables of a predicate, you say there exists a number for it. So for example, let p of n be the predicate that n is even. Right. So what is this? This is a predicate. There is values of n for this to be true. There is also values of n for this to be false. So it's a predicate, right? But if we consider, uh, we write this backwards e for exists n. So what this means is there exists an n. Uh, and then we bind it to some predicate. There exists n p of n. What this means in English is there exists n such that uh, n is even. Or there is an even number. Right. So we'll talk a little bit more about this binding action, but this doesn't. This is now no longer a predicate. It has no free variables, right? The free variable has been what we would say is bound. The the quantification binds the free variable. So now this is a predicate, except the the, the quote unquote free variable has been bound to this quantifier, and all the quantifier does is say that there exists an n, right? There are many parts of English that talk, assert the existence of an object, right? This is, doesn't say that there's like an algorithm to find n, or we know exactly what n is. Rather, all it asserts that it exists, right? Um, what's another example of uh, uh, like, we can assert the existence of something without knowing where it is, right? About knowing that it, it's there. Uh, some example is like there are like through some statistical argument under some assumptions there must exist two people in the state of Georgia that they had that have the exact same number of hairs on their head, right? We don't know. We know that's true. We don't know which two people. You know, we'll talk about this more extensively. It doesn't say we know which n or how to. It doesn't give a way to find n. All it does, and I have to be very explicit about this, n exists. That's it. You know. Um, right. Any questions on the existential quantifier? Yeah. So would that make this statement true, or is it still? Um... This is a propos. This is a now a proposition that has been, and every proposition is assigned a truth value. So there is an even number is either true or false. Is it true? Yes. There is an even number. Let's find one too. Okay. Done. Right. More questions on the on the uh, predicate uh, and the and the, and the quantification. The, again, the way to remember this is backwards e is ex existential, or asserting the existence of an object. Consider the predicate uh, p x y uh, to be elephant x is heavier than uh, duck y. 
right? So elephant x is heavier than duck y. What is the universe of discourse of the variable x? Elephants. Elephants, yeah. The collection of all elephants. It would be where the element x is drawn from. That's its universe of discourse. The, similarly, the universe of discourse of y is the collection of all ducks, the set of all ducks. We'll talk about what a, a duck is. I mean, when everyone knows what a duck is. We'll talk about what a set is later, right? So those, again, are drawn from the universes of discourses, which are not necessarily like numbers or something, right? But known objects. Um, and if we were to quantify over some of these variables, what is exists x uh, p of x, x comma y in English? Now, there's a few ways you could phrase this. Uh, here's an, uh, one way. There is an elephant heavier than a duck. Why? Is that a predicate or a proposition? Proposition. It's a proposition. It depends. The truth value determines. It depends on what duck uh, we plug in there. But it's not dependent on the elephant anymore because we're asserting that there exists an elephant, right? What about if we were to write in English exists y, p uh, x comma y? How would you write this in English? Uh, elephant uh, x is heavier than some duck. Now, for what y would that be true or not true? For what x would that be true or not true, right? So you, it could be true if you could find one duck heavier than the lightest elephant, right? Um, if you had the lightest elephant and the heaviest duck, it probably would still be true. But suppose that there's one duck heavier than the smallest elephant, then it might be false, right? Um, what if we quantify over both? That button? Nope. That button? Okay. Um, there exists x. There exists y. P of x, y. There... Uh, here's an English way to say it, and I'll, I'll, I'll write this one twice. Some duck, some elephant is heavier than some uh, duck. Right. Um, more formally, here's the here's like the most formal way to, to way to say this. There exists an elephant, and there exists a duck, uh, such that the elephant is heavier than the duck. Right. Now, this is a predicate or a proposition? proposition? It's a proposition. It has no free variables. All its free variables have been bound to. So it can, its truth value can be determined. Now, to determine the truth value, we would have to go check like all the elephants against all the ducks until we found one elephant heavier than one duck. But I'm, that would not be too hard. The first elephant and the first duck we try would probably satisfy it. And we wouldn't have to check anymore. Right? Um, there's also another quantifier you should know, which is not the most important one. It's this one. Uh, what this means is there exists a unique n such that p of n. So, when you put this exclamation mark there, that means unique. This is not like a real quantifier. It's sort of a shorthand notation people use. But you should know the symbol, what this means if you ever see it. There exists a unique n such that p of n. So 
there ex so for example, if p of n was the predicate for like n is even, uh, there exists a unique n such that p of n would mean there exists exactly one even number, which would be a proposition we would evaluate to be true or false. 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 There is not exactly one unique number. There is not exactly one even number, right? So that's just what you should see. It's not like a real quantifier to me, and we'll, we'll explain why a little later. Any questions so far on the existential quantifiers? All right, what about, um, there are other quantification words in English that are not asserting the existence of an object. Um, these are like for all, for every, um, for each, Right? These are also quantification English terms. Uh, and we use these, we use a upside down A for this quantification. This means um, for all n p of n. Right? So what this means is for every single n in whatever universe of discourse it's drawn from, elephants or numbers or whatever, it's p of n is true. This is also a proposition and not a predicate anymore because its free variable has been bound. This is a different quantification, and it's not the same quantifier as existential. They're very different, right? So we asserted that uh, exists p of n was true when p of n was the predicate that asserts uh, n is even, right? So let p of n n is even. Um, for all n, p of n is then uh, for all n, n is even. Or suppose n comes from the natural numbers, the whole numbers, even negatives, whatever. Not, let's suppose that it's every number, there's no real numbers or fractions or anything, right? So n, the universe of discourse of n is the uh, is numbers. Um, is this, this is now a proposition and not a predicate? Is it true or false? This is false. Why? One exists. One is not even. OK. Um, what about exists and p of n? This is true, right? Some number is even is a very different quantified statement than every number is even. Those assert very different truths, right? And of course, you can mix quantifiers up. You can say for all exists for all p of n, right? Something like this. Um, we may even uh, express, the reason I don't really, uh, well, let's, let's do another example first. Um, let P of X, Y again be uh, the predicate uh, elephant X heavier than uh, duck Y. What is uh, for all X uh, P of X, Y? Every elephant is heavier than duck Y. Yes. What about uh, for all X, for all Y, P of X, Y? What about um, there exists an x for all y? 
p of x, y. Is heavier than yeah. Some elephant is heavier than every duck. Right? Um, now, in general, you may be wondering, well, can I put these in order? Can I swap these around? That may be the, the first question you have. In general, you cannot permute quantifiers. The reason I stress this is actually like, um, when I was learning this, I had like an artificial intelligence exam. And one of the problems was on propositional logic this way. And I had assumed, actually, you can probably permute the quantifiers and do everything nicely this way. And it turns out that's not true in general. So you, and I remember failing that exam and being spiteful because no one ever told me you can't permute the quantifiers. So every time I teach this, I'm like really, I really emphasize that you can't reorder the quantifiers. Because without this, um, people do it every year. Um, so here's an example of one. Let x and y be drawn from the, uh, from booleans, from uh, zeros and ones. Consider the following two uh, propositions. Right? This first one, say, they, they say different things. X and Y are drawn from Booleans. True or each X and Y may, may be assigned to be true or false. Okay? We're just going to evaluate this. For all X, there is a Y. But what this is saying is that there may be a different Y for each X. Right? So for all X, there is a Y. So try X to be true. Is there a Y when X is true? If X is true, this is false. So choose Y to also be so choose when when x is true, this is false. So choose y to also be false. So that that works. When x is false, this is false. So choose y to be true. So this, as a proposition, is true, right? <coughs> we agree with that. For there is a there may notice here it was important. There was a different y for each x. But what this says is for all x there is a y. Okay. This says something different. There is a, a y for all x. So some value of y has, for all possible values of x, this to, for this to be true. Well, let's see if this is true. Suppose y is true. Right? Y can either be true or false. Suppose y is true. If y is true, is it true for all x? Is it true for all x? Can you give me a value for when y, if y is true, can you give me a value that this is false for? When x, for x? Yeah. So if y is true uh, and x is true, then this is false. So the whole thing is false, right? Because this is false. So y can't be true. So if there exists a y, y would have to be false. If y is false, does there exist a value of x that this is true for? That this is false for? Excuse me. False. False. If y is false, then set x to be false. Then this, this is false. So the whole thing is also false. So it is, in fact, not true that there is a y for every x. For this statement to be true, one of the values of y, true or false, would have to be uh, chosen such that for every way you could choose x, true or false, the statement would have to be true. So in general, this one is false. You can't, in general, permute the quantifiers. You can't reorder them, right? Sometimes you can. In general, you cannot, right? So don't do it. Questions on that, on reordering quantifiers? I'll do one more uh, reordering example. Uh, suppose we did uh, something like this. For all sailors, there exists a hat. Uh, 
Uh, what this means is each sailor has a hat, right? So what you do is I'm going to draw the sailors. Their little sailor hat. For all sailors, there exists a hat, right? If we were to permute the, permute the quantifiers, there is a hat for all sailors, right? What this means in English is not that uh, every sailor has a hat, but that there is a hat every sailor has to share. So there's just one hat, and they all have to share that. They have to take turns wearing the hat. It's not, they're very sad, you know. So they, those are very different statements, right? For all sailors, there exists a hat. This allows there to be a different hat for each sailor. There is, there is a hat. There is one hat. There is a hat for all sailors, right? So the assignment is totally different, even in English, for the quantification. Order definitely matters. Uh, one more quick detail is um, we can express uh, the uniqueness quantifier in terms of a combination of for alls and exists, right? If we say that there exists a unique n such that p of n, what we're saying is, let's try and write this out in English. There is... What is, it, what is another way to represent uniqueness? It, something is unique if it exists, but there is no second option, right? So it can't be 0, and it can't be 2 or more, right? It's exactly 1. So what we're going to do is just assert that such an x exists, and that there is no different value that also it, the predicate is true for. So how would you write this? This is logically equivalent to uh, there exists an n. Um, such that p of n is true. Would you agree? So far, we're, we're not finished. But if there exists unique n, then there certainly exists an n. Now we just want to ensure, enforce that there is no other value it is true for. So what we do is say for all other values that are not x, that are not n, it should be false. So how would we write that? We want both conditions to be true, so we'll and them together. And we'll say for all values m, we want it to be false for all values m, except the time that m is the same value as n. So what we'll do is say, if m does not equal n, then what? Not p of n. Not p of m. Uh, notice the use of square brackets and uh, parentheses. Doesn't really matter. It just makes things cleaner, I think, to mix different types of parentheses. Use too many parentheses, it gets confusing to parse. So just it's okay to use, especially at the outermost quantification, to use if you're doing a giant combined statement to do a uh, big square bracket. Notational convention, right? Could have been parentheses. Doesn't really matter. Function arguments though have to be parentheses, predicates, right? Um, do we agree these two things say the same thing? We understand why this asserts that there's a, this asserts the uniqueness, right? For all other values m, this is different. Questions on this? Questions? Oh, okay. Let's take, uh, let's do, let's talk about the negation of a uh, quantifier. Let uh, p of x represent the uh, predicate uh, x is mortal. Um, uh, then what is for all x p of x in English? All men are mortal. Let's just do the universal discourse of men. This is a classic uh, 
all men are mortal, uh, classic propositional logic phrase. All men are mortal. Right? Um, what is the negation of this? We want to take the negation of a quantifier. What is not uh, for all x, p of x in English? There exists a man that is immortal. Before we do that, let's read it in English. Not all men are mortal, right? If not all men are mortal, you can assert that there exists one man, at least one, which is not mortal. So there is, is exists, and not mortal is the negation of our predicate. So the negation of for all x, p of x is equivalent to there exists an x such that negation p of x. Now, we see that works in English. Let's just define the rule. When you define the negation of a quantifier, you flip the quantifier from for all there exists, and then you negate the inside. You guys know those, all those like derivative rules or whatever. Uh, derivative of f of x is... Uh, f prime of x, whatever, right? Same thing, chain rule stuff. Similar, similar stuff goes on here, right? We negate the outside, uh, and then we uh, do the inside. What if we did uh, the negation of the negation of for all x, p of x? Yeah, that's just double negation law, so that one's for all x, p of x. But just to be sane, let's uh, take the negation of this, right? So what is there does not exist x such that uh, x is not mortal. What do you do is you apply the same rule. When you negate an existential quantifier, what is it going to be? Uh, all. Yeah. A universal quantifier for all x, not, not p of x. What is not not p of x? p of x. So we see it still works true, right? Any questions on negation of quantifiers? Um, what is, let's suppose we have uh, the negation of a string of quantifiers. Let's say for all x, uh, excuse me, there exists x for all y, uh, there exists z. Some, let's say we have 25 million quantifiers, and then we say p of x comma y comma z some predicate involving 25 million, uh, million propositional variables, uh, something like this. And we negate the whole statement. What we're going to do is we're going to flip every single quantifier. We're going to chain through all of them, flip all of them, and then negate our predicate. So this is just going to be, for all x, there is a y. Uh, for all z, the negation of p of x comma y. Do we agree? Um, let's practice taking the negation of an existential uh, for all x. Excuse me, there exists a unique x such that p of x, right? That's what that shorthand means. Let's write the negation of this. What is the negation of there is a unique one? In English, we would say there does not exist a unique x. What does it mean for there to not exist a unique x in English? Before we do the symbolic logic, what does that mean? There are many or all. There are many? What else? Or there are none. Or there are none. The negation of there is exactly one is either there are less than one or more than one. So there are zero or two or more. Right? So let's compute the negation of this formula and then just see what we get. Uh, this is going to be the negation of uh, there exists x, p of x, and yeah, 
there we go. There exists x p of x and for all y, uh, x does not equal y implies p of y. Please, excuse me, not p of y. Just making sure I have all my parentheses in order. Right. Now, as we flip the negation in, we have this external negation. There exists x. So this is going to be written as what? For all x. And then we're going to negate this internal, right? When we have an and of two things, how do we negate both of them? What is the, what is, uh, the negation of an and? It's an or, and what else? What's the name of that? Not, not P or yes, but what's the name of that? De Morgan's. That's going to be not P or not Q, right? So when we write this for all x, we're going to say not P of x or the negation of for all y, x, implies, x does not equal y implies not P of y, right? Now, this is ugly. Let's simplify this a little more. Um, for all x, not p of x, or, now let's distribute this negation through. What is this going to be? There exists a y. Yeah, or there exists a y uh, such that. Now, how do you negate an implication? This one I don't expect you to remember off the top of your head. but. If uh, p implies q is equivalent to not p or q, then the negation of p implies q would be equivalent to what? p and not q. Yeah. p and not q. So what we're going to do is this is our p and this is our q. p implies q. What we're going to do is not p and q. Excuse me. p and not q. Yes. So p and not q is going to be x, x does not equal y. And not q is simply just going to be p of y. OK. That's our simplified form. What does this say in English? Let's translate this back to English. right? If, again, propositional logic is supposed to simulate the way we think. When we said there exists a unique x, and we said the negation of that should be there's no x, or there's two or more x. There just can't be exactly one x, right? This means for all x, either p of x is false, or if there is a y that, it's, uh, that they're different, p of y must also be true. So what that means is if there is, a y, if there is an x that it's true for, it's true for two or more of them, another y. If x is true, if p of x is true, there is a y such that. Uh, P of y is true. Sorry, what? No. Oh, okay. So this is the, the zero, or, and this is the two, or more, right? All right, let's take a five-minute break.